Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geocenta Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESCCP. This webinar is the second in a two-part series on managing AFFF impacts to subsurface environments and assessing commercially available PFAS-free foams. We will start with a brief overview of CERTUP and ESCCP, followed by two technical presentations. First, Dr. Jinyoung Liu from the University of California at Riverside will discuss his research on PFAS defluorination and reaction mechanisms for PFAS degradation using hydrated electrons generated under uh, UV conditions. Jin Young's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Then Mr. Jerry Bach from Jensen Hughes uh, will talk about his work on assessing the effectiveness of AFFF alternatives, including PFAS-free foams, as well as wetting agents and other alternatives. Jerry's presentation will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and in your slides. Um, and uh, if you have difficulty downloading Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge. If you continue to have difficulties with the slides or if your screen freezes, please try keying Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select the speaker and microphone, and follow the prompt as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have a problem, please call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. In case of continued difficulties, you can download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Note that we will also be live streaming the webinar on the CERTIP and ESCCP uh, YouTube channel at the link shown here. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We really encourage you to submit them as you come up with them. And when you do submit them, please make sure to add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify it during the Q&A session. With that, I would like to introduce Cara Patton, who is an environmental project manager at Noblis and the technical assistant for CERTIP and ESCCP's environmental restoration program area. Cara has worked with CERTIP and ESCCP since 2008 and before that, she worked at the Drug Enforcement Administration, where she was a forensic chemist. Kara received her master's degree in chemistry from George Mason University. Kara, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. First, I wanted to give you a brief overview of who we are and what research we are doing in terms of PFAS. <laughs> CERTIP and ESTCP are two companion programs. The Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, or CERTIP as we refer to it, is a partnership between the Department of Defense, the EPA, and the Department of Energy, and is a science and technology program that has been around since 1991. Goal is to develop research from fundamental to more applied so that we can create the knowledge and technologies to impact the world environmental management. Companionship with ESTCP. The Environmental Security Technology Certification Program 
BSTCP is a demonstration and validation program created out of the Department of Defense and is designed to take research, knowledge, and technologies developed under CERTIP and other research programs and demonstrate them in the field. The ultimate goal being the technology transfer of these technologies to accelerate broader application and commercialization. Research under these two programs is guided by a few environmental drivers. The first being sustaining our testing and training ranges, facilities, and operations. As you can imagine, this is a very broad area and covers the range of environmental drivers in itself, such as threatened and endangered species and noise issues. We are also looking towards to reduce current and liability, which is also quite broad and can take the form of pollution prevention to eliminate hazardous materials or process at our military installations and issues from past practices where we have impacted groundwater, soil, and sediments, and some of the issues, which is what we're talking about here today with people. I wanted to go ahead and in the direction of the source. This, the web link at the bottom of the page as well as in the chat box. This is an interactive graph that shows the past and presently funded PFAS related research. Starting back in 2011 with the first group of PFAS related projects in CERTUP, through the projects and topics that are currently funded in sample analysis, treatment, AFFF alternatives, other areas. On the top of the graph is CERTUP, and it, each box represents a different group of projects funded. Bottom underneath the years, ESTCP. If you click on each box, it'll take you to a subsequent web page additional information about the project or project. All projects that CERTUP and ESTCP fund have a project overview that are updated throughout the lifetime of the project with all of the public information available about the research. It is very important for us to transfer the information being developed under CERTIP and ESTCP, and we have a number of ways that we do this. Through in-person trainings when we are allowed to, videos, guides, and ultimately as today with webinars. We are always trying to get this information out to people that are interested in it as well as the information. On this page, you'll notice a list of some future webinars that we have planned coming up. And since you're on the related webinar, I'll point out the webinar January 28th, which will be looking at PFAS sampling and treatment. Registration for these webinars are live shown here as well as in the webinar chat. I'm able to also access any archived webinars that have happened previously. And finally, I wanted to just mention our CERTIP and ESTCP symposium that will be held virtually November 30th through the de sorry, December 4th this year. Registration is open and there'll be a link popping up in the chat for that registration as well. The symposium is a great way to see the breadth of the work that, we, that is being completed under CERTIP and ESTCP and the work on PFAS related issues as well. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Rula to introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you so much, Cara. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jinyoung Lu, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at the University of California uh, in Riverside. Uh, Jinyoung's Current areas of research focus on the development of chemical technologies for the degradation of water pollutants, uh, such as PFAS. Jin Young earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in environmental science and engineering from uh, Tsingchao University in Beijing. And he earned a doctorate degree in environmental engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Jin Young, please proceed. Okay, thank you, Rula. Good morning, everyone. 
First, I would like to thank uh, 30 program for giving me this great opportunity to present our research results. So today I'm going to uh, cover the following components. Sorry about that. So today I'm going to uh, uh, cover the following components. First, I would, I, I would like to uh, show the general structures of the PFAS pollutants in the firefighting impacted groundwater. And second, we have used the combination of advanced reduction and oxidation to treat a series of the PFAS structures and obtain some very informative structure reactivity relationship. And with these mechanistic insights, we try to uh, combine the advanced reduction oxidation to complete some nearly complete destruction of the PFAS pollutants. And I would like also to provide some implications to the remediation and management on the PFAS treatment. And finally, I will briefly talk about the benefits to the DOD's uh, environmental protection efforts. So first, uh, because the DOD's Remediation sites are contaminated by the use of the aqueous film forming foam, and we call that AFFF. It's very important to know what are the representative, or at least the majority, of the PFAS pollutant structures. And we can actually find some uh, very useful information on the structures from the excellent groundwater analysis reports. For example, I'm citing the, uh, this paper from ESNT published in 2014. So on this slide, you can see that uh, there can be hundreds or even thousands of individual PFAS molecules or the surfactants. But in general, uh, there are uh, some common structural features so that we can actually group these PFAS pollutants into three major structural categories. The first category you can see here is actually based on the perfluoro carboxylate. So the floral alcohol moiety on the left side and the highly diverse organic structures on the right side is actually linked by the amide functional group. And we know that in the natural degradation process or by some engineering treatment process, the amide bond can be cleaved or hydrolyzed into the carboxylate. So we actually uh, have the task to treat, uh, the, to realize the degradation of the perfluoro carboxylate molecules. And the second category is a perfluoral sulfonate based. So we can see from these figures that the floral alcohol chain and the highly diverse organic moieties are actually connected by the sulfonamide bond. And in the natural degradation and some engineering treatment process, we can realize the hydrolysis of the sulfonamide bond into the sulfonic acid. So uh, from these two categories, we, we know that one very representative and famous perfluoro carboxylate is PFOA, and the, the other one, also very famous and representative perfluoro sulfonic acid, is the PFOA. Then on this slide, I'm showing you the third major category, which is the fluorotelomer based surfactants. So, from these structures, we can see the perfluoro alcohol moiety and the highly diverse organic moiety. Uh, functional groups are connected still by some linkers like the thiol group here or the sulfonamide group here. But the, the feature for these fluorotelomer based structures are there are some repeating hydrocarbon units or the CH2, CH2 units separating the perfluoroalkyl chain and the end functional group. And for this category, I would say these structures have been the dominant species as a newer uh, developed AFFF formulations mainly use the fluorotelomer based surfactants. So with these uh, basic information on the three main category of the PFAS molecules, if we want to provide a comprehensive solution to the PFAS contamination problem, I would say it's very important to test the treatment technologies with all of the three PFAS categories uh, with the individual compounds. If any technical challenges is identified from the initial testing, then we will figure out the solutions to overcome the challenge. So we use this strategy as a guidance for our uh, study project. In my lab at UCR, we used 
UV generated electron as a major a main technology to deal with the PFAS pollutant. So regarding the hydrated electrons, um, it can be generated under the ultraviolet irradiation on the aqueous solution of sulfide, iodide, or some other chemicals. So the hydrated electron has a very negative redox potential of minus 2.9 volt in theory. So it is believed that the hydrated electron is able to cleave the carbon fluorine bond. Because carbon fluorine bond is so recalcitrant, we need to rely on some super reducing species to do the work. And to obtain the comprehensive understanding of this UV sulfide system, in my lab, we collected the perfluorocarboxylic acids, the perfluorosulfonic acid, and fluorotelomers in all of the possible chain lengths that we can buy from the general chemical vendors. And to test the individual treatment results, here on the right side, you see our uh, UV basic reactors. For this reactor, we generally have about 600 milliliter of the aqueous solution so, uh, added with 10 millimolar of the sulfite as a source of the electron. And in the center, you can see the typically the 18 watt, 254 nanometer uh, low pressure mercury lamp. And we adjusted the pH to 9.5. And we also added some carbonate as a buffer and also as the groundwater matrix, the common groundwater matrix. So we turn on the UV light and then we monitor the degradation of the parent compound, as you can see on the left side, such as panel A, which shows the degradation of the parent perfluorocarboxylic acid. And we can see the general feature is uh, these acids actually follow some very similar degradation profile. And the majority of these perfluorocarboxylic acids can achieve the complete removal or degradation of the parent compound with, within 8 to 12 hours. And on the right panel, the panel B here, so this actually describes the defluorination profile. And the defluorination is defined as the ratio between the released fluoride ion in the solution after the treatment over the initial total fluorines contained in the parent com PFAS compound. So the deformation ratio from the perfluorocarboxylic acid uh, for most of the structures are around 55%. But in sharp comparison, if we test, when we tested the fluorotelomer structures, which are still the carboxylic acid with perfluoroalkyl chains, but right now we have the separation with the CH2, CH2 groups between the perfluoroalkyl chain and the carboxylic acid. Then we started to see very strong dependence on the chain lengths. For example, the best substrate in this case are the, the triangle, the hollow triangle, representing N equals to eight, which means eight carbons in the fluoro alkyl chain plus the CH2, CH2, CH2 minus, which is 11 carbons in total. So for this structure, the degradation is show the highest rate, but it's still in comparison to the per fluorocarboxylic acid in panel A, we can see the degradation is much slower. Even after 48 hours, there's still about 15 or 20% parent compound left. Um, and for the shorter chain compound, we can see the degradation is showing poor and poor performance. And basically for the very short chain telomer structures, this UV sulfide system is not working. And on the panel D, we can see even for the deformation profile, we see the similar uh, trend for the longest n equals to eight, we can achieve slow deformation, and uh, after 48 hours, it can reach about 35%. Still, this level is significantly lower than uh, the, the data for the perfluorocarboxylate, which, which are around 55%. And we also tested the performance of treating perfluorosulfonic acid. And from the panel G on the lower left, we can also see strong dependence on the chain lengths. The N equals to eight is PFOS. And after 48 hours, the degradation is basically complete. But for N equals to six, the PFHXS, and N equals to four, the PFBS, is not working very well. And the deformation profile also showed a very similar trend. Therefore, from the previous two slides, and from the, the treatment results from the three categories, we can have some general impressions. The first one is 
we can see that all of the perfluoro carboxylic acids can be effectively treated by the UV sulfide system, and we don't see a significant dependence on the chain length. But in terms of treating the fluoro telomeres and perfluoro sulfonates, we saw the strong chain length dependence, and specifically uh, for the shorter short chain structures, they are very challenging substrates, and the UV sulfide system is not so effective. With these challenges identified, we have several things to continue. So the first, first work is to further improve the performance of the UV sulfide system because at, at least we have learned that this system is working not so bad on the perfluoro carboxylic acid treatment. And the previous data you have seen are all uh, collected from using the solution pH at 9.5 and we call that traditional setting. So the time for the complete removal of the parent compound uh, perfluorocarboxylic acid will take eight to 12 hours, which is relatively long. And if we calculate the electro electric energy consumption uh, using the EE slash O, which means electro uh, energy consumption for uh, removing one order of magnitude of the parent compound or say we, we, we can remove 90% and leaving 10% of the parent compound in the solution. After achieving this goal, the system will consume between 77 to 174 kilowatt hour per cubic meter of water to be treated. So this is a relatively large number and the maximum deformation percentage for those individual compounds ranges between the 52% to 61%, which is not complete. So by simply raising the solution pH to 12 by adding some sodium hydroxide, uh, we can achieve some significant improvement of the system performance. As I sh show you on the right side, now the time for the complete removal of the parent compound, uh, perfluorocarboxylic acid, the time can be shortened to just uh, between 30 minutes to one hour. Then the corresponding E slash O can be further reduced to uh, 5.3 to 8.9 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. So we can see a significant improvement of the energy efficiency. And furthermore, I want to highlight that the maximum deformation ratio has been increased to 73% to 92%. And this is also a huge improvement because if we conduct the reaction at pH 9.5, even if we extend the reaction time to uh, even longer, we cannot achieve or further improve the deformation from 55% to like around 80%. So then uh, the conclusion is by raising the pH, we can achieve significant improvement in multiple aspects. Then after realizing that the pH 12 can help the system a lot, we started to test the performance on treating the challenging flora telomeres. Now we have the CH2 separating the flower alcohol chain and the carboxylic acid. So from these two figures, we can see that we can see the significant improvement also on the flower telomer structure if we raise the pH from 9.5 to 12. So multiple structures can have significantly improved the deformation profile, but still for the shorter chain compound, the treatment is challenging. If we still have some uh, short chain, if the flower alcohol chain is still short, then the system is not so effective. And we call that uh, highly recalcitrant for telomeres. And then it naturally comes to our mind that we can use some oxidation to help the conversion from the fluorotelomers into perfluorocarboxylic acid because at least for the perfluorocarboxylic acid, the UV sulf sulfide system is very effective. And then when we see the hydrocarbon bonds or the CH2, CH2 groups. We're excited because uh, we can now use hydroxyl radical to attack the uh, carbon hydrogen bond. And these are the weak point to initiate the conversion. So then with, by using the hydroxyl radicals, uh, initially we thought hydroxyl radical will convert telomeres into perfluorocarboxylic acid. But we also find that when we use hydroxyl radicals, uh, this oxidation process can actually release a lot of fluoride ions from the telomer structure because the 
hydroxyl radical reaction is radical based and it can trigger the zipping off of some fluoride from the molecule. And we also uh, observed the formation of the perfluorocarboxylic acid in various chain lengths after uh, the oxidation reaction is finished. So this is good news to me, be, to us, because now we can use uh, the hydroxyl radical to do the pre-oxidation and then the remaining compound are mainly the perfluorocarboxylic acid, which are the good substrate for the UV sulfide system. And uh, on the other hand, we know that the UV sulfide system at pH 12 can achieve some deep deformation from perfluorocarboxylic acid. But still, there are about 10% to 20% CF bond remained in the treatment res residues. It cannot achieve 100% deformation. So what happened during this process? By conducting some transformation product analysis and theoretical calculations, we learned that if we still see some residual CF bond in the system, that, that might be caused by the conversion of a lot of carbon fluorine bonds shown here in the carbon hydrogen bond. Because the accumulation of, or the introduction of the hydrocarbons into the molecule molecular structure will significantly increase the CF bond dissociation energy. So that in the residuals, even if we, we are having the most uh, potent hydrated electron, but it's, it still cannot treat the highly, uh, highly stable, the high energy CF bond here. So this is the main reason why the UV sulfide system alone cannot achieve complete deformation. However, right now we see the hydrocarbons then that's the good news for us because now we know that hydroxyl radical oxidation will help. So this is why we propose that the post-oxidation is also very important. So now let me quickly show you the benefit of using the combined oxidation and reduction. So this figure shows you the results on using the perfluorocarboxylic acid, treating the perfluorocarboxylic acid. So uh, because Perfluoro structures are not reactive with hydroxyl radicals. We don't have the pre-oxidation step here. And we directly start with the reduction using the UV sulfide system. And the, the blue bars shows you the deformation ratio after the UV sulfide treatment. And we can see the deformation can be very deep, uh, around 80% or even 90%. However, they are not complete. And after the reduction, we followed up with hydroxyl radical based oxidation. Now we look at the purple bars and we can see the deformation reached almost 100%. Then we can have the conclusion that the post oxidation is really helpful in achieving the deep destruction of the perfluoral carboxylic acid. And then uh, when it comes to the case of the fluorotelomers, now I'm showing you is the treatment results of the N equals to four, six, and eight fluorotelomer sulfonic acid. Now we have the CH2, CH2 separations here. So the first step must be the pre-oxidation. And even for the very recalcitrant N equals to four structures, we can see the, the first step of oxidation released almost 60% of the fluoride, followed by the second step of UV sulfide treatment, and it reaches 80%, and the third step of the oxidation post the treatment, we can achieve over 90% deformation. And for N in, in, in equals to six, we achieved almost 100%. And for N equals to eight, it's a little bit challenging and we still see about 10% gap. But uh, in general, we, the data has shown that the combination of the oxidation reduction and oxidation can achieve very deep uh, destruction of the molecules. Okay, so with all of these uh, data, we can have some conclusions from the aspect of application. So we have seen that the three major PFAS categories identified in the AFFF impacted groundwater, they, uh, which are the perfluorocarboxylic acid, sulfonic acid, and the fluorotelomer acids, uh, can be treated by the combination of oxidation and reduction. And among the three, the perfluorocarboxylic acid are the most labile structures because just by turning the UV sulfide system on, we can achieve relatively deep deformation and there's no inland dependence.
uh, and the performance and the efficiency of the UV sulfide system are being further improved. What I mean is not only raising the solution pH, but we are also working on uh, some other approaches to further shortening the treatment time, which means if we can have the shorter treatment time, the energy efficiency can be even improved. And in terms of the mechanist, uh, mechanistic insights, first we have learned that the advanced oxidation can convert the fluorotolomers into the perfluorocarboxylic acid. This step can actually eliminate the channel's dependence if we want to uh, achieve the very deep destruction. And the incomplete deformation of the perfluorocarboxylic acid by the UV sulfide system is actually caused by the formation of some uh, carbon hydrogen bond. And the presence of carbon hydrogen bond will significantly elevate the bond dissociation energy of the remaining CS bond, making the system, uh, the residuals to be difficult to treat. However, by following with advanced oxidation, just by using the common hydroxyl radicals, we can cleave the remaining carbon fluorine bond from the hydrogen rich residues. And regarding the benefits to the, the DOD's environmental protection efforts, first, uh, our results to date have provided a database for the structure reactivity relationship for the three representative PFAS categories. And we also provided the proof of concept for a complete, or I would say the near complete PFAS destruction strategy. And uh, this can be transferred to other areas and other treatment systems, because many other uh, excellent PFAS treatment systems we have seen, such as plasma treatment or the electrochemical treatment, can provide both reductive species and oxidative species at the same time. For example, the plasma can generate hydrate electron and hydroxyl radicals uh, at the interface. And for the electrochemical system, there are the cathode compartment and anode compartment, which can do the oxidation and reduction separately. And regarding the technology development, uh, we are actually making some efforts trying to uh, conduct some field demonstration projects so that we can further verify the, the system regarding the efficacy and efficiency in treating the real samples just by applying the UV-based reduction and oxidation. And lastly, we can, uh, the results can make some recommendations for the current and the future use of the PFAS. Although we have learned that there are some uh, timelines for the stop, uh, the el elimination of the production and the use of the HFF in the firefighting, but we still have the legacy pollutions already containing these three structural categories in the groundwater. And uh, in some other areas where the PFAS cannot be completely phased out, at least we can provide some recommendations to the floral chemical industry for their uh, consideration during their design of the PFAS molecules so that they will know what kind of structures is easier to be treated and what kind of structures are difficult to be treated. And we hope the outcomes will influence their decision making. And if you have any uh, interest in the detailed data, you can uh, find our publications so that you can get more information. And I would like to uh, ask you uh, answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tinian, for a great presentation. We have a lot of questions for you. Uh, and we're going to start with one from the Vermont uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, how can you ensure that the PFAS molecules are being uh, defluorinated and that the carbon-carbon bond is being uh, broken um, and uh, you're not making just shorter PFAS? Uh, okay, so this is a great question regarding the reaction mechanism. So due to the time limit, uh, I don't have uh, the slides showing you the detailed degradation pathway. But uh, if you check our publications, we, we provide a, a detailed degradation pathway that the degradation of the perfluoro carboxylic acid actually have multiple pathways. The one I have discussed today is the exchange of the fluorine atoms into the hydrogen atom with the uh, carbon backbone still intact. But actually there is another pathway that we actually 
prefer that pathway is the decarboxylation. So we can uh, continuously removing the terminal uh, carboxylate group and make the molecules shorter and shorter. And when we make the molecules shorter, we are actually generating the shorter chain perfluorocarboxylic acid. But if we can keep that reactions going on, after each chain shortening step, we're going to automatically release two fluorines from the molecule. So we hope the molecules can be shortened step by step and then release the fluoride. So yes, the formation of the shorter chain carboxylic acid is there, but uh, that's what we hope and uh, that's what we want. And then we could just remove all of the fluorines. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jimmy Young. This is a question about the uh, mechanism that you discussed. What is the mechanism that increases PFCA or perfluorocarboxylate removal when the pH is raised from 9.5 to 12? Can you elaborate on this, please? Oh, okay. So regarding the mechanism, um, as I just mentioned, we have observed at least the two mechanisms. One is changing the CF bond into CH bond. And this is actually the reductive process uh, initiated by the hydrogen electron. The other one I just mentioned, the decarboxylation, I would say uh, that is involved with some oxidative process. So something oxidative should be involved in the removal of the end uh, carboxylic group. And we right now we attribute that to the the formation of the sulfide radical in the system. So something which is still mysterious, but uh, it plays some oxidative role in the UV sulfide system to trigger the decarboxylation process. So uh, that's for the first question. And second question regarding the pH change. Um, because we use the sump buffer and the system is relatively uh, stable in terms of the pH control, so when we showed you the pH 9.5 data, we just start from uh, pH 9.5, and after the reaction, the final pH was about maybe 9.3 or 9.2. But uh, regarding the pH 12, that's uh, what we intentionally raise the pH by adding the hydroxide base. So that's not some uh, pH change with the reaction going on. So we intentionally adding uh, hydroxide to raise the pH so that we can uh, perhaps quenching some, removing some quenching species that can combine with the uh, hydrated electron. Because one theory is if there are a lot of protons in the solution, the proton and hydrated electron will react and scavenge the hydrated electron. So when we further increase the pH, then we have much less concentration of the proton and that's helping the system. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is a question from the Army Public Health Center. Do you ever see fluorotelomers converting to PFSAs or the sulfonates? Uh, from the fluorotelomers into PFSA, the saponic acid. Uh, we, don't, we don't see this kind of uh, re conversion from our own data. But from the literature, we can see that if people propose the radical involved reactions, if we have some floral alcohol radicals and if we have some uh, sulfide radical, such as uh, in this system, the UV sulfide, we are sure there are some sulfide radicals. People propose the recombination of the floral alcohol chain radical and sulf sulfide radical to generate some um, sulfonic acid. But in our Test, so we haven't seen this. So perhaps the concentration is too low uh, or by some other reason, but uh, we, we don't see this for ourselves. But I would say the mechanism is possible. Thank you so much. This is a question from the University of Washington. Uh, do you detect any other oxidation or reduction byproducts due to the presence of sulfide or is the sulfide inert in your reaction system? Uh, yes, so regarding the potential uh, byproduct, I would say uh, the sulfide, uh, the, the system of UV sulfide will generate the, the radicals and the radical involved reactions are typically complicated and then I would not exclude 
any uh, possibility of forming some other sulfide containing organic molecules or other byproducts. And for example, uh, if we have multiple sulfide radicals, they can also recombine into some, uh, I, I cannot recall the name, but the S2O6 anions. Uh, and I'm not sure what the uh, ultimate fate of this anion. Maybe they can be fully converted into sulfate. I'm not very sure. But regarding the organic structures, that's some uh, very interesting area to further explore. But right now, we don't see uh, the significant formation of any uh, byproduct, like uh, something based on the, the sulfide. Great, thank you. Um, we've got several questions about uh, related to the costs of the technology that you're investigating. Uh, they are coming from the USDA and from the policy group. Do you have any information at this point on uh, scaling up um, your technology okay. and the cost associated with that, Jinya? Okay, so uh, we are uh, kind of excited about this technology because uh, all of the conversions can be enabled by just turning on the UV, UV lamp. And the UV system we are using is uh, just 254 nanometer irradiation. And this kind of configuration has been very common in many places uh, for uh, water and wastewater treatment. So then I would say uh, for this part, uh, the cost will not be too high because if you have the existing system or even you want to start from scratch, but uh, there are established protocols and uh, the catalog, so you can uh, have the system. So the capital cost for the UV base is, will not be too high. And then regarding the electrical energy consumption, as you can see from the data I just uh, showed, so our E slash O number is already uh, below 10 kilowatt hour per cubic meter for the perfluorocarboxylic acid. So I think this is relatively a low value and we are further uh, decreasing this value. So uh, regarding the electro ener electric energy consumption, that's not a, a very big challenge in my opinion. But I, I think one potential uh, consumption of the energy can also come from the organic uh, matter treatment where we need to further uh, work on how to eliminate the organics by conducting some oxidation process. So for example, we imagine that if the real water or from some uh, ion exchange uh, generation waste, if there are a lot of organic compounds or from some uh, landfill leachate, if the water is black color, so then maybe the UV system efficiency will be very low so that we have to use some other oxidative methods to first uh, remove the color. And this might involve more energy input to achieve the work. And uh, we just recently start uh, exploring this area. So, but uh, in general, I think the capital cost for the UV system, electrical energy for the UV sulfide and electrical energy for the uh, hydroxyl radical oxidation will be the three components for the, for the overall cost. But uh, we are optimistic about uh, this aspect. Thank you. We have more questions than what we can answer, but I'd like to pose uh, two very quick questions for you before we transition to our next speaker, Jin Young. Can your mm -hmm. system or the mechanism that you described, is it uh, possible to use it to treat some of the perfluoroalkyl ethers, such as GenX and Adona? Uh, yes. So uh, we have uh, another publication just the working, focusing on the structure reactivity relationship in treating a series of the ether compounds. So if you're interested, you can uh, also visit our website and get a publication, which is uh, open access. Yes, the system works for the ether compounds. Great. But the and, uh, mechanism uh, is a little different. Okay, great. And then the uh, the last question uh, relates to some of the other questions you've received, and that is closing the fluorine mass balance. Um, specifically on slide 28, you showed the generation of the fluoride ions uh, and um, 
for fluorocarboxylates as the oxidation product, were, were you able to close that mass balance or are there any other products beyond what you are showing in these experimental results? Okay, so regarding uh, the fluorine mass balance from the oxidation, uh, what I can provide is if we add all of the perfluorocarboxylic acid products, we calculate the total number of the organic fluorine uh, and add it with the free fluoride ions we released from the oxidation, we can achieve about maybe 85 to 90% uh, of the fluorine balance. So that means the oxidation is not only producing the perfluorocarboxylic acid we are expecting, so it might also have some other side reactions, but in they are in the uh, um, minor uh, proportion. So I would say, yes, we can basically close the mass balance, but with some exceptions. And this kind of uh, result has been reported by other researchers working on the oxidation technologies. So perhaps some uh, OH group is added is added to the backbone. But uh, in general, we I would say uh, this process is uh, mainly producing the PFCA and we can just uh, propose to use the following UV sulfide to achieve deep deformation. But if we see any uh, gap of why we cannot achieve 100% deformation, that might be from some side reactions we haven't seen were uh, well known so far. Great, thank you for a phenomenal job. We'll try and get back to some of the other questions towards the end of the presentation. But at this point, I'd like to go ahead and transition to our second presentation. Um, the speaker will be Mr. Jerry Back, who is a senior fire protection engineer with Jensen Hughes in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Jerry was one of the original uh, Hughes associate employees. He has over 35 years of experience covering a spectrum of fire protection topics and issues. He has performed uh, thousands of full-scale fire tests, including evaluations of AFFF agents and systems, aerosols, high expansion foam systems, gaseous uh, agents, water mist systems, and water spray dilute systems. Uh, just uh, recently, he completed a parametric assessment of underwriter laboratories listed um, commercially available PFAS free foams on behalf of the National Fire Association Fire Protection Research Foundation, and that study con, uh, consisted of 165 tests. Uh, Jerry has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in fire protection engineering, both from the University of Maryland. Uh, Jerry, please proceed. Thank you, Rula, and thanks to CERDUP and ESTCP for letting me present here today. So, um, so, so the name of my program on the website is an assessment of commercially available fluorine-free firefighting foams and agents. And I wanted to kind of start off with a quick explanation of why there's a difference in terms. So we all, we're all here because of the PFAS issues, the groundwater contamination and the remediation issues. But um, and about 10 to 15 years ago when the PFAS issues were first, were first identified, the fire protection community decided they were going to start to research and develop new foams and agents that did not contain PFAS. Now, at the time, they weren't exactly sure what the definition of PFAS was, and I think that there was only about 200 compounds that were identified. So they decided, well, since it's kind of a moving target, um, and today I think there's over 6,000 PFAS uh, uh, compounds identified, they decided they were going to focus on producing foams and agents that had no fluorine in it at all with the idea that if there was no fluorine in, it, in the composition, then it would have to be PFAS-free. So for this discussion, fluorine-free is going to equal PFAS-free, or be synonymous with PFAS-free. So here's the agenda of the presentation today. I'm going to do a little bit about the background, I'll talk about our six-step approach. I'll tell you a lot about the testing and the capabilities we've observed the schedule for completion, the program summary, and the DOD benefits. Now, I gave this presentation a year ago almost to the day, and it focused strictly on the program review because we had no data. So I'm going to focus mostly today on the results that we've seen so far. 
So as a quick uh, introduction, we all know that, that AFFF has been the industry standard for over 50 years for combating flammable liquid fires. That their main applications include the maritime industry, the aviation industry, and the petroleum industries. The problem, as we all know, is that the PFAS and AFFF has environmental and health concerns and is basically being banned for use um, throughout the world. Our ultimate goal is to identify an environmentally acceptable AFFF alternative, but our specific object objectives are to quantify the capabilities of the available alternatives today and to begin to develop a database which we can use for decision-making processes in the future. So here are the six tasks that are included in the program, a literature review, a very high level environmental analysis, which is very preliminary, uh, real scale fire tests, down um, screening and rankings from those real scale fire tests to approval scale, and then a full blown documented um, final report with the, with the database that we developed, which will ultimately be owned by the Naval Research Lab. And when we first started laying out the program, we decided we were going to try to do real scale fire tests first before we did the approval scale test, which kind of sounds backwards because you typically start small and you work large. But we had a concern initially that maybe the mil spec fire tests are so strict we're eliminating potentially good agents going forward. Now, unfortunately, COVID kind of got in the way and we had material issues as, as far as trying to get fuel tanks and things like that. Um, for the large scale fire test. So we ended up running the, the uh, larger scale, the real scale test and the approval scale test kind of simultaneously. As a real quick overview of task one, the literature search, they were about 60 to 70 um, agents, uh, phones and agents, which we identified during kind of Google search and looking at some of the manufacturer's data. Now only about 40 or 50 of those actually had real pedigrees. So be careful because there's a lot of really good salesmen out there, and I always call them the snake oil salesmen. But uh, so there's some agents out there that are people who are, are marketing as fire suppressants that have no background whatsoever. And we down selected, uh, we included 40 to 50 of those in our database right now. And our database includes all the pedigree information, what approvals that they have, their MSDS sheets, where they're made, any kind of references we could find. Um, going forward. So we actually have that as a, as a kind of our starting point database. And our original intent was to down select 10 for testing. And we ended up uh, testing about 20 to date. Um, th things kind of got carried away as we started to, to run tests and people were providing us with new formulations, prototype formulations. So I'll talk a little bit about the, what those results are in a few seconds. I'm going to present 14 of the uh, available candidates in the results that I have, but uh, I think we've done 20 of them or so, uh, like I said, to date. Now, we did a, a very high level environmental analysis, which basically consisted of looking at the MSDS sheets and, and, and trying to identify any obvious chemicals that, that, that could have been bad actors. Now, uh, the, the, the top five candidates, the top five best performers in our studies to date are being ecotox tested by other um, sort of ESTCP programs. So uh, while we only did kind of a high level skim, we are gonna get a, uh, a much better analysis on the ecotox issues of these candidates going forward. So this is a description of the tests that we run. Um, I have them flipped again in order. Um, so we, we ran the 28 square foot pan fire from the military specification, and we ran it at two and three gallons a minute, and we used both gasoline and Jet A. Um, that test is conducted with an aspirating nozzle, which is kind of key because um, the fluorine free alternatives typically require a decent aspiration, good foam quality to work since they don't typically make a film like AFFF did. And it kind of is a baseline comparison. The uh, mil spec tests are conducted with gasoline at two gallons a minute, and the extinguishment time is re the requirement is 30 seconds. We ran the, the real scale fire test. It's a 400 square foot pan fire. You can see a picture off to the right with a 30 gallon a minute nozzle. And we ran it with and without a foam tube. And we, the reason we did that was with, with, with the foam, without the foam tube, the foam quality was relatively low um, and with the foam tube. And a foam tube is a legacy piece of hardware that goes back you know, 50 years. And it's designed to make good bubbles and good foam. And you, you, I'll show you a little bit about that in the next a few slides. 
And we ran mostly these fires using Jet A, but we did some with gasoline. And it's a point worth noting that the two gallon a minute uh, over 28 square foot is the same application density or application rate as 30 gallon a minute over 400 square foot. So we have some decent kind of scaling kind of data that we're trying to sort our sort through a little bit. So it's 07 gallons a minute per square foot if you're talking uh, English. And if you look at metric, I think it's like 2.9 liters per minute per square, uh, per square meter. So here is the first table of the results. I'm presenting it as a blind study now. Um, maybe in the future we'll be able to put names of products next to these. I'm not exactly sure the best way to do that going forward, but we are researching if there's a clever way that we can do it. But for now, I'm going to present these results as a blind study. This is the 28 square foot pan fire tests. Uh, what you see is both gasoline and Jet A. There are 11 fluorine free foams that we tested, and we're all baselining against the AFFF, which is the very top line. And we also did three wetting agents. Now, wetting agents have different pedigrees than the foams, in quotes, do. Uh, and um, wetting agents are typically tested to NFPA 18. And it's basically a wetting agent is designed to be able to put out both kind of class A material as well as uh, hydrocarbon class B materials. And they're tested at different rates. And we selected three different types of wetting agents. We, we selected an emulsifier, an encapsulator, and what I call a sticky water, something that's kind of designed originally for kind of um, wildfire, uh, wildland fires that they spray and it kind of sticks to the trees and provides kind of a thermal barrier as the fire spreads by. So um, it's just high level kind of this description to this and I'll get into a little bit more detail in the next few slides. The one thing that jumps right out at you is Jet A is significantly easier than gasoline as we probably would expect it because Jet A has a higher flash point than gasoline. Um, and it, there's not a lot of difference in the capabilities between the foams and the agents that we're able to put that out. In fact, 13 of the 15 agents on the sheet here were able to extinguish the Jet A 28 square foot pan fire in less than 30 seconds at two gallons a minute. So that's an interesting discovery. And of course, gasoline is much, much harder and a lot of agents and foams struggle with it. But it's kind of a high level um, uh, statement. You know, obviously AFFF was the best, and I'll talk a little bit about how much better in the next few slides. The fluorine free foams came in second, the wetting agents came in third, and we also have tested, you know, four or five kind of new formulations that CERTIP and ESTCP are funding the development of and that they're just very prototype, very, very preliminary data, and that they're a distant fourth because, I mean, they don't really have any kind of a pedigree and they're, they're being tweaked kind of on a daily basis. So I broke down the performance. Um, I had listed those in the previous table at, with the top performers at the top and the bottom and the, and the lower performance at the, toward the bottom of the table. So the top, there were five fluorine-free foams that all performed relatively the same. Uh, and they performed, which I have them highlighted here in green. Three of those, um, all five of those had multiple pedigrees. And by that I mean is they had either like UL162 listings or EN1568, as well as ICAO listings. And that um, three of them were ICAO level C, uh, as well as those, um, the UL uh, or EN uh, tested and listed foams. There was also the next group down, there was three fluorine free foams that put the fires out pretty well, but they were more like about a factor of two to three uh, longer than um, the AFFF. The green uh, band was a factor about one and a half to two longer. And then the bottom, the bottom uh, six there, the three wetting agents and three of the other fluorine free foams uh, were, were, were kind of a distant third place. And uh, what's interesting is the wetting agent guys, they, they, they take offense whenever I tell them, look, you guys didn't do that well. And they, and it, but but uh, the, the argument for them to not do well is, is that, that those agents are actually tested at about 10 gallons a minute on a 50 square foot pan fire where the fluorine free foams are tested at three gallons a minute and AFFF is tested at two. So, I mean, so, so by definition, even if they, even if they have these listings and pedigrees, 
they're, they're tested to a much easier test protocol than the fluorine free foams and the AFFF. So bottom line is I won't be receiving a Christmas card from NFPA 18, I don't think, this year, but uh, well, maybe next year. We'll see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the comparison between the top five uh, fluorine free foams as compared to AFFF. And uh, for those of you who've seen me present before on, on results, I, I, I love the L curve way to, to present the data. The L curve has the extinguishment time on the Y axis and the application rate on the X axis. And from a mechanistic standpoint, it makes perfect sense. And let me explain why, what I mean by that. Is when you get down to very low flow rates, the fire is consuming the, the, the foam as fast as you're putting it on. And that's the left-hand side of the curve. So when you actually increase the flow rate and you're basically making progress against the fire and then you're coming down the slope of the curve and so you get some kind of critical value where, where it kind of levels out and now the foam's winning, uh, it, it, the foam's overwhelming the fire. So that kind of defines the shape of the curve. So uh, interestingly, the, uh, the L curves are parallel for above a certain application rate. They're, they're, they're parallel for the Jet A all the way down to 04 gallons a minute per square foot. As the results I showed you on the previous table kind of showed similarity. Now, again, it's one and a half times longer um, than the extinguishment time of AFFF, but the fires are going out. They look kind of the same. When you, when you fight them, they just take a little bit longer. And for gasoline, they're parallel above 07. And when you get down below 07, then you start to see significant differences in capabilities. And we actually see difference in capabilities between the, even the top five. What you can see there as the curves separate on the right-hand side, that there is a, a, a separation between the fluorine free foams and, and the, the legacy AFFF, mil-spec AFFF, when you start getting down below 06. So I'll talk uh, about our large scale or real scale fire tests. They were 400 square feet. We used 150 gallons of fuel. We did both. We did most of them with Jet A. We did some with gasoline. For those of you who talk, like to talk heat release rates, it's about an 80 megawatt fire. It's a 40 foot high continuous flame height and about 60 intermittent. So it's a pretty big fire for those of you who don't fight fires. And it's actually a pretty big fire for a lot of people that actually do. It consumes the fuel at about 40 gallons a minute. And here you can see a picture of what it looks like with, compared to, there's John Farley in the left in the outfit and stands giving him the directions on the right-hand side. We, we ran that fire using, um, we, we combated that fire using two nozzle configurations. We used the standard 30 gallon a minute nozzle. And that's what John's using at the top of the image, the top picture right there. And it's, uh, we used a 15 degree spray pattern, and we did that for, for a couple reasons. One is 15 degree got us the best aspiration in the foam for both AFFF and the fluorine free foams, and it came in at about five uh, for the AFFF and at about six for the fluorine free foams. But also, the reason we, the, it, it's, it's kind of a challenge to fight a pool fire with a, with a, a pattern that's tighter than that because. When you tighten up the pattern, you knock the fuel out of the pan, fires flying everywhere, and the stream kind of overwhelms the, the, the foam blanket. It's just a mess. So there's a lot of technique in fighting a pan fire with a relatively higher flow rate nozzle, and this is only 30 gallons a minute. So the guys out in the field that, that do this on a daily basis against airplane fires and things like that typically come in at 100 gallons a minute, and the turrets are five, six, a thousand, get thousands of gallons a minute. Now, we also use the foam tube, which is what I said, it's kind of legacy technology. It's very simple. It's basically something that clamps on the end of that nozzle. There's a screen in it, and you can see the holes kind of toward the right-hand side of the yellow piece. And when the stream hits the screen, it entrains air from the vacuum, and it makes good bubbles. And you can see stand discharging it into the pan below. It kind of gives you a little bit more gentle application, but you can also see the differences in the aspiration from just looking at the images. John's look like kind of a very small, fine droplet, you know, but Stan's look like you see big bubbles flying. And with the foam tube on, we got AFFF expansions of about 18 to 1 and fluorine free foams expansions of about 22 to 1. So here's the table for the results, kind of summarizing the results. These are the average times for the uh, 400 square foot pan fire. 
Um, it looks like about a factor of two difference between the, the extinguishment times, one and a half to two for the Jet A, comparing the fluorine-free foams and the AFFF, both with and without the foam tube. Um, the foam tube actually reduced the um, extinguishment times by about 30 to 45 percent, as we would expect, because again, as I mentioned earlier, the fluorine-free foams really require decent foam quality to work well. So uh, we were able to get all get the fires out, all the Jet A fires out in less than 60 seconds, and, and a lot of it was actually driven by edge effects. Um, and I'll show you a video at the end to kind of give you an idea. And as I mentioned earlier, gas. Gasoline is very te uh, technique dependent as far as the extinguishment times because when you spray the foam directly onto the pan surface or onto the fuel surface, you're splashing gasoline. And gasoline, when it splashes, it just makes fireballs and does all kind of stuff. And the Jet A doesn't do that do that quite as quite the same way. So from an apples to apples comparison, our fluorine free foam extinguishment times were about one and a half to two times longer than the AFFF. As I mentioned earlier, that we had about a 30 to 45 percent reduction in extinguishment time with the use of the foam tube, but we also lost about 40 percent of our reach. So, when, with that nozzle and straight stream, we can probably throw 80 to 100 feet. When we put the foam tube on at five degrees, we were getting about 40 to 50 feet. Here's a video so you can kind of see what it looks like when these guys fight the fire. This is Jet A, this is with the foam tube, and this is with one of the fluorine free foams. Stands off to the right hand side of the image there, and the fire is burning. We let it go. We go 15 second pre burn after full involvement. So, right now, John's calling out full involvement. That'll start at 15 second clock. His arms in the air, so that's that, that sort of that 15 second. And what you'll see is you'll see Stan coming in from the right hand side with the nozzle. And it'll drop it, they'll drop the foam in the front corner, right, right hand corner of the pan. And within about 10 seconds, you'll see most of the pan will actually be extinguished. It'll be cutting across the surface. And there'll be most of the fire will be around the edges. You can see it there, the center looks pretty much out. And he, he now then goes around another, by the 20 second mark, he has all the larger flame down around the edges. And it ends up being just licks of flame and that it takes to about 35 second total before he actually gets all of the fires out in the pan. So from my personal perspective, I think it doesn't look too bad, but okay. So um, as far as uh, wh where we are and going forward, so we have a few more tests we're gonna run with fixed nozzles that was included in the program. We haven't run those yet. Um, then we will write an all-encompassing final report, which will have all the data in it, um, as well as we're going to develop that database, kind of a searchable, searchable database, spreadsheet-based for NRL to own and, and continue to update as we get, go forward in the, uh, in the research and development of this. Ultimately, I'd like to get a lot of the branches of the military together to kind of review the report and, get, and kind of get some kind of consensus, which is going to be challenging, I think. Um, well, what we believe the findings and the conclusions are and develop a path forward. But the report and all this will be on the public domain by the end of but early next year, January, I think is the end of the end date. So it's kind of a real high level conclusion. HRFLF's going away. DOD needs to address the problem. Understanding the current alternative capability is required and a database on the capabilities of what out there today is a, is a logical first step and will help us develop hopefully a mil spec somewhere in the future. But ultimately, we have to determine how good is good enough, right? So that's where the challenge is going forward. And, and from my perspective, watching some of these fires, you know, I think we may be closer than we originally thought. But, uh, but we'll see how good is good enough when we actually get all the uh, end users and the powers to be together and have a chance to talk through some of these results. The benefit to DOD, the database and the capabilities of alternatives will allow them to basically keep track of what they've tested and what's coming forward. Links to real and uh, um, approval scale fire tests. I really didn't cover that very well, but um, we got a little bit of a difference as far as an extinguishment density between the large and the small scale. It took us a little bit longer, about 50% more agent per square foot or square meter to put the fire out. But generally speaking, what wasn't bad. We went up a factor of 15 in fire size, 
but we only went up uh, about a factor of 50% more agent to able to get the fires out. And again, a lot of it's driven by edge effects. And who knows whether edge effects are real in a real life. I mean, I don't think the airplanes are going to crash into pan. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, ultimately, this data will allow the potential validation of commercially available products. Maybe what we have right now is good enough already. But again, it will provide us a baseline database to develop a new spec going forward. So I need to acknowledge John and Stan, John Farley and Stan Korowski, who, uh, who fought the fires at the Naval Research Lab, and John's my partner in a lot of these programs. I uh, also have to mention Noah Lee, who's a, from our environmental group, is my, is my go-to guy on all the environmental issues, and Dan Martin and Lindsay Huffer, who basically made it I made it capable for me to walk around acting like a boss, and they did all the work. So that, my acknowledgement to those guys, and thanks for all their help. And basically, that concludes my presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry, for a phenomenal presentation. We've got about 10 questions here that have come in. We're going to start with the elephant in the room, and that is, will the names of the various products be made available in your final report or in a database that others can use. But yeah, that that that, that is the elephant in the room. So I mean, so uh, we're, we're trying to figure out a workaround as far as that's concerned. Um, right now, we're keeping it as a blind. There, there is a. I think that there's better than a 50/50 chance that we'll be able to put the names to these going forward. But we really need to talk through some of the legal aspects of it with the, both my company and the government because over the years even the government has been skeptical about using names on products uh, because the government doesn't endorse any or condemn any by by definition and and either do we as a company so uh so, so we'll see um fingers crossed just keep paying attention to the website and, and we'll figure out a way to get that going forward worst case though um, the, the manufacturers that have been involved in this that made these products will know where they were on the program. So if we end up writing a mill spec that looks like that maybe the top five can pass, they will be, everyone will be notified, especially the top five, and that they should be the first ones through the approval process because they'll have confidence that they can meet it or, or something like that. So we'll see. Thank you, Terry. Uh, this is a question from the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. What are the actual fire suppression chemicals that are present in the in the PFAS-free foam? Uh, do they vary from one product to another? They, they do vary, um, and a lot of that's very, uh, you know, client or uh, manufacturer uh, proprietary information. Um, you know, most of them are, are, are hydrocarbon surfactants, um, if not all of those. Um, but uh, that's about all I can tell you exactly on the composition. You, you can look at the MSDS sheets and get an idea um, what they'll tell you is in the phone. But again. A, there's always 50% of, you know, magic potion that you'll, they'll never be able to, they'll, they'll never, you know, can, uh, divulge to the public, so. All right, great. Now, we've got a couple of questions from airports. This first one is from the fire chief at CPAC International Airport. Do you think that there could be a different um, PFAS, that there would be different PFAS-free products for aviation use? Uh, and maybe another level um, with different uh, capabilities for petrochemical industry uh, compared to what DOD is going to be requiring. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. So, um, so, so the reason we added the Jet A right, right off the bat during this test program was because, you know, when we developed the mill spec, you know, whatever 30, 40 years ago. It was because the, the, the Navy was using JP4, which is very similar to gasoline, and that, you know, and that there are gasoline hazards in, in, the, in a lot of the DOD facilities. So um, if you're looking strictly at aviation and you have strictly a kerosene-based Jet A, JP8 kind of a, a hazard, um, it, it becomes an easier problem. And I think that um, that there's a, a sound logic to develop a you know a, a standard strictly for that. Now ICAO only tests um, uh, 
kerosene-based fuels, I think, and there are three levels, A, B, and C. So, uh, so I, I, I KO level C, which is the, the hardest test. I think three of the fluorine free foams that we tested are actually been approved to IKO level C. So, so, so maybe that's kind of the go-to if you have strictly kerosene-based Jet A and JPA type fuels. Thank you so much. And this is a follow-on question from Dallas Fort Worth Airport. Did you do any burn back testing? Yes, we did on the smaller scale. We didn't do any on the large scale, uh, but we did. We, we, that will all be published in the report. Uh, generally speaking, um, most, if not all, of the fluorine-free foams do pretty well in the burnback department. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, this next question is from the Southwest Research Institute. It looks like all the uh, PFAS free foams that you tested do not appear to meet the MILSPEC requirements uh, as it relates to extinguishment time. Is there going to be a discussion in your report about or recommendations about modifying the pass fail criteria? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and I probably should have covered that, but I was too excited about results. So um, th there is a, um, a mandate right now for the for the uh, DOD to write a land-based mill spec. So there is another mill spec coming, coming down the pipe. It's about a year and a half to two and a half years out that will address land-based used foams, uh, which will have different pass-fail requirements. Um, and we'll figure out what they are when we get all the powers to be in the different branches of the military together. And we identify the fuels, what their primary fuel hazards are, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So, yes, there will be a new mill spec uh, for land-based applications. All right. Thank you so much, Jerry. This next question is from DuPont, and I think it relates to AFFF. Um, when you did your tests and compared the performance of the PFAS free foams to that of AFFF, were the AFFF testing done with the 3%? concentrate solutions or the six percent that, that's a good question and I probably should have mentioned it all well all the fluorine free foams and the a triple F so were all type three three percent solutions the, the wetting agents varied from manufacturer to manufacturer some of them were even as low as you know 0.4 percent 0.5 percent some of the wetting agents are very very low concentrations but all of the foams in quote including the a triple F we're all type three, three percent mixtures. Great, so much. Um, the next set of questions have to do with the types of fuels that you use, and you've alluded to some of this, but let me just quickly uh, go through some of these questions, Jerry. Did you consider the difference between winter and summer blends in gasoline in your study? We, we, we ran the tests with mill spec. Uh, the, the gasoline that's used in the mill spec, which contains no, uh, it's unleaded gas and it contains no alcohol at all. All right. Uh, and did any of the gasolines or fuels that you use include ethanol? Um, did you do any testing with ethanol, given the, no. the response the, to the, the first half you, of the question? Yeah, well, we, we did no tests with uh, any polar solvents, any ethanol, and, and it's a point worth noting, and I meant to note, and again, you always forget stuff when you're giving your presentation, is that um, only one or two of the fluorine-free foams that I tested were actually considered um, AR, uh, alcohol-resistant foams. So all of the top five um, were not alcohol-resistant foams, so they're capable nor is mil spec a triple f by the way um so i have no uh understanding or data to suggest it to be able to tell you how well mil spec a triple f will do as well as the top five performers against ipa or any of the polar solvents thank you and i do want to ask this question although we're going to back up a little bit because it is a question from the army uh, public health center um can you just give us an idea about the typical volume of foam that is used to extinguish a fire in a true firefighting emergency 
or maybe a range, Jerry? Wow. Oh, good question. Um, no, I, I cannot. Um, it would be an interesting study. I did a study for the um, NFPA Research Foundation on high hazard fuel trains. Um, and, uh, and what we found was in a lot of the big emergencies, uh, catastrophic events, all of the incident reports are focused on what caused it as opposed to what they did to mitigate it. So the data set's kind of limited on actual, on actual results um, as far as how much agent it takes to put out a fire under certain conditions. There's a lot of variables you can imagine there. But as far as extinguishment densities, which is a term I use a lot, gallons per square foot or um, liters per square meter, you can back those numbers out of the results on these tables. And I, can, I will provide a table of that in, in the final report. But, um, you know, it, O3 um, type gallon, O3 to say 0.1 on lab scale type, type, type numbers, gallons per square foot or, or where we're coming in at. Now, again, we're, you know, when you fight a fire in real life, you have much higher flow rate devices and things like that, and there's a lot of overkill in some areas and underkill in others. So uh, um, I'm not sure that answered your question, but at least got, got just some things to think about. All right. Uh, one last question for you, Jerry, and then I want to pull uh, Jin Young back into this discussion. And this next question is an important question. It's from Greenfire. How well does the viscosity and corrosivity of the new PFAS-free foams work with current available delivery systems being used for ARRF? That's a real good question, and it was another point that I wanted to make in my in my presentation. So the five uh, fluorine-free foams that performed the best, which I did most of my comparison on, three of those are Newtonian. So they flow somewhere between like water, AFFF, and or maybe corn syrup. And two of those were non-Newtonian, so they flow somewhere between molasses and jello. Um, now, uh, the manufacturers of each of those products um, have listed proportioning systems um, for each of those products, so they couldn't be fielding any of those. So it would require some work between the manufacturer and the various hardware manufacturers to be able to to make them work in current in current hardware whether it's minor tweaks or major tweaks obviously if you have a a, a concentrate that flows more like a triple f and it's i think your tweaks will be minor but if you have something that's that's more of a semi-solid then then obviously you have a lot more work ahead of you. But uh, none of them right now are, are obvious drop-ins, but I do think that you can get there with, with some, some minor adjustments on a lot of the Newtonian uh, the, uh, concentrates. Great. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, we're going to use the last few minutes for questions that came in for Jin Young, but before we let you go, um, can you elaborate um, or just quickly summarize the next steps and a schedule until the release of your final report? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to actually have another program coming up as well. So, I mean, I have a few more tests to run on this. The final report um, and the database will be out to the uh, CERTIP ESTCP panel as well as some of the other branches of the military to review uh, early December timeframe is what I'm shooting for. Um, as far as a path forward, so I have another program coming up. Since I mentioned a couple times during this program that uh, this presentation that the fluorine-free foams or the, and, and these alternatives in general are very highly dependent on how well you aspirate them. Um, I have a study coming up to look at how well current discharge devices used throughout the military make foam, what the aspiration, expansion, and drainage times are for that, and then relate that back to extinguishment capabilities. So we may uh, identify some kind of critical value that you need to be above both in 
uh, aspiration and which may eliminate the use of certain discharge devices going forward. And that's that program is basically just started and won't be done until next year. But uh, this one will be done by the end of the calendar year with the with a report on the street, but in January timeframe. Thank you so much, Jerry. And Jin Young, let's just get you uh, back on the line here. Um, there is so much interest in destruction technologies uh, for PFAS, uh, given their presence in the environment. What, in your opinion, are the future research directions for using specifically chemical methods, both oxidation and reduction for PFAS degradation, and scaling these technologies um, to, to the field? Oh, okay. So the first question is uh, the future, um, the future research direction, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, regarding the future uh, research direction, we are actually working on several uh, areas, such as first, how to further improve uh, the treatment efficiency, especially shorten the reaction time, and also further increase the deformation ratio. So one direction we are working on is how to uh, directly um, achieve almost the 100% deformation just by running the UV sulfide. Uh, because as I showed you in the earlier slides, they, we have 10 to 20% gap by uh, turning on the UV sulfide for at pH 12 at 20 degrees C. So we are thinking about perhaps maybe uh, raising the temperature or uh, playing with some other parameters may may help because our theory is uh, perhaps those highly stable CF bond can be cleaved if we uh, elevate the temperature so that it can help the hydrogen electron or some other reaction mechanism to overcome the energy barrier. So that's one direction we are working on. And alternatively, we also would like to uh, just to introduce alternative reaction mechanisms so that uh, maybe the remaining uh, CF bond can be cleaved, or can we just uh, switch the reaction pathway from the very beginning? For example, we introduce something new to help the to uh, switch the reaction pathway, because uh, at least we have learned that the the chain shortening will be really helpful to ensure the deep deformation. There will be no accumulation of the CH bond and no elevation of the remaining CF bond. So how can we? just to provide some dominance of the chain shortening pathway instead of introducing more and more uh, hydrogen in the molecule. So that's uh, what we're doing right now. And regarding the scaling up, um, as I briefly mentioned, we want to uh, put the system into some uh, demonstration projects. So we, we really need to see uh, what will happen if we have the, the real system. For example, uh, when we put one UV lamp into the six 100 mil uh, aqueous solution, yes, it works very well, but what if we use the, the same lamp in treating a multiple liters or even gallons of the water, then we believe the performance will be lowered for a little bit because the, the light path will be longer. So then uh, regarding the scaling up uh, question, I think at least the, the geometry or system configuration of how many lamps we are going to uh, deploy into the reactor will be some uh, major technical problems and uh, technical question and uh, some other similar questions need, needs to be answered by conducting the real test. Great. Thank you so much, Jin Yong. And thank you again, Jerry. This was really a lot of wonderful information. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to remind our audience members that our next webinar in the CERTOP and ESCCP webinar series is on Thursday, November 5th. It's in the Resource Conservation and Resiliency Program area, and it will focus on providing a multi-species evaluation of hibernation physiology and influence on risk factors associated with the white nose syndrome. That's a fungal disease that's responsible for killing uh, millions of hibernating bats in North America. Dr. Sarah Olson of the Wildlife Conservation Society will be our speaker and to view her biography and to register for this free webinar, please visit the uh, webinar uh, webpage. Registration is open for this webinar and also for 
a long list of 2021 webinars, um, many of which are on PFAS. Um, and at this point, I'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on the webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this point if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your participation.